How you doing? This is Mike from Mike's Random Thoughts. So this is a new history podcast episode. And I decided to do this one on Dietrich Bonhiever. Now, when we think of World War II, we often picture, you know, Hitler, Russia, Winston Churchill, concentration camps, Joseph Stalin. You know, I've done numerous different um, history podcast episodes. So when I was thinking about it, I wanted to do another one. And naturally, I gravitated towards the World War II area, and I decided to do an episode on Dietrich Bonhiever. And I want you to understand, though, before we get started, that this man was much more than just a pastor, okay? Now, he was actually a pastor, a theologian. He was also a resistance fighter, and that's very crucial for you to understand. So Dietrich was actually born on February 4th, 1906 in Baslan, Germany. Now, this area is actually currently located in Poland. Now, he came from a very well-off family, known to be an intellectual family. His father was actually a very well-known and famous psychologist, and his mother, Paula, was a very renowned teacher. Now, he was the sixth child of eight children. They say that Bonhiever, even at a young age, showed an extreme interest in theology. He studied theology, actually, at the University of Berlin. So, get this. He earned his doctrine at just 21 years of age, and he earned it by writing his thesis um, that he called the Communion of Saints. Now, it actually, he was an explorer of the concept of the church as a community of believers instead of an authority figure. Back in the day, the churches a lot of times was seen as more of an authority figure as, a, as opposed to a community aspect. So Bonhiever, he spent one year studying at the University of or at the Union uh, Theology Seminary back in 1930. So it was in New York City that he experienced a vibrant African-American church. Now this actually changed his perceptive and understanding of Christianity and social justice. You see, he was actually very moved by Pastor Adam Clayton Powell Sr., who was the senior pastor at the Abstinian Baptist Church located in Harlem, New York. Now, I want you to really remember this guy, Pastor Adam Clayton Powell, okay? Um, Bonhiever stated that that experience that he had at that church not only deepened his commitment to social justice with what he's seen and heard, it actually influenced his later work in Germany. So by the time that Bonhiever had returned to Germany back in 1931, the, the political climate, as you guessed it, was drastically changing. He knew that the rise of the Nazi party would actually be a threat to the German church. You see, Hitler, he wanted to align the church with his regime. It was back in 1933 that Bonhiever delivered a special radio broadcast. And he spoke of the dangers of a leader who would become the idol for the nation. And when he was doing this, in the middle of stating how Hitler was a danger to the German public and trying to, trying to turn him into the idol for the German people as he was stating all that and the reasons why it was bad, they cut his signal clear off in the middle of the broadcast. And we all know what that's like, right? Anyways. So Bonhiever continued to speak out against the Nazis. And he established the, what he called the Confessing Church, which opposed the Nazis' interference in the church affairs, as well as upheld the Christian faith. The Confessing Church was actually a very crucial movement standing in opposition to the German Christian uh, movement that actually sought to align the Protestant Church with their Nazi ideology. So Bonhiever's commitment to his faith and resistance to the tyranny, it only grew stronger as a result. You see, Bonhiever joined the ADRA, which is a German military intelligence organization that secretly harbored a resistance network. Now, Bonhiever used his position and his family's uh, wealth to help the Jews in escaping the Nazis and their persecution, as well as a secret commitment and communications network with the Allied forces. So naturally, his involvement in the resistance was a dangerous maneuver. It was a very dangerous situation for him to be in. Not only, you gotta think about it, his family was very wealthy. They're very well known. It was like, a good portion of his family was part of the resistance fighters, but a good portion was not. That's what made it a very dangerous maneuver for him. And he was a very much well-known pastor in that area. 
So he had, it was in a dangerous situation on multiple different ways you could look, multiple fronts, so to speak. Anyways, so 1943, he was arrested for his activities in the resistance movements. And he spent the next two years in different various prisons in Germany, as well as concentration camps. It's about to get interesting. So even though he was living in very harsh uh, conditions, he continued to write and inspire those around him, they said. His letters from prisons reveal his deep faith as well as his unwavering resolve. Another one of his most famous works, The Cost of Discipleship, challenged Christians to live out their faith with courage and conviction. So April 9th, 1945, just a couple weeks before the end of World War II, Dietrich was executed at the Fossenburg concentration camp. He was only 39 years age, uh, 39 years old. His legacy, however, lives on. His writings actually inspire people around the world to stand up for justice and to live out their beliefs with courage and dignity. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, uh, that makes a very much a distinction between what he called cheap grace and costly grace. Now, everybody that's a fellow Christian, we're only six minutes in. It's going to be a very short uh, podcast episode. However, I want you to remember this. Cheap grace, he said, refers to the grace that is offered without any requirements for change or sacrifice. The idea that one can receive forgiveness without any repentance or commitment whatsoever. Now, costly grace, on the other hand, it demanded a response. It requires di uh, discipleship, sacrifice, and willingness to grow and follow Christ, even at your own great personal cost to yourself. Meaning, even if it's dangerous, you might lose your reputation, your friends, finances, whatever the situation may be. You will still follow Christ, even at the, your own personal cost. Now, the concept of costly grace was central to Bonhiever's theology and his, his resistance to the Nazis. Now, he believed that the discipleship uh, means to take, a, hold on, to take a stand against the justice when it becomes dangerous to, to his own life. The story is a testament to that. Your, your life will be a testament to the dangers, what you're, what you're going through. Now, hold on a second, okay? Because we're gonna, I wanted to go into some side notes before I go into this. This is the first time on my show I've had to do this with my notes. So, some side notes that about him that I found really interesting when I was doing research, all right? So, July 20th, the, there was an assassination attempt on Hitler. We all know about this. It was um, when Hitler was having that meeting in a bunker and the bomb went off. They made movies about it and everything, right? Here's what you don't know. Bonhiever and his brother was deeply involved with that assassination attempt. So, 1935, Bonhiever was ordered, um, was offered a basically coveted opportunity to study nonviolence resistance underneath Gandhi and his Ashman. However, he returned it down. He decided to return to Germany instead um, of taking that opportunity. There, he was the head of the um, underground seminary in for training confessing church pastors hold on a second the other founder of this movement uh, Barth was actually driven back to Switzerland in 1935 by the Germans okay so later Nimmenholer was arrested in July of 1937 by the uh, German SS squad okay So in August of 1936, Bonhiever's um, authorization to teach at the University of Berlin was actually revoked after he was denounced as a pacifist and an enemy of the state of Germany by Theodor Heckel. So another guy, Theodor Heckel, got him fired from his position at the university, stating that he was a pacifist as well as an enemy of the state. Uh, so they took away his teaching position. All of this is crucial to understanding when you're understanding this guy, okay? So by August of 1937, Himmler himself decreed that the education and examina um, examination of the Confessing Church of Minister can uh, candidates is illegal. Now, the Confessing Church, remember, is what Bonhiever helped establish. That's what I want you to remember right now. Himmler himself said it was illegal. So September of 13, uh, 1937, 
Gosselow closed the seminary school, uh, and by November, they arrested 27 pastors and former students. 1938, the Gestapo banned Bonhiever from ever entering the city of Berlin. So they let him go around Germany, but he was not allowed to enter into Berlin whatsoever, which is interesting when you think about it. So the Nazis, the authorities eventually banned him from actually speaking in public at all. Um, he was actually required to report all his duties and activities to the police. 1941, he was actually forbidden to print or publish anything whatsoever. So basically back then, this would be their version of censoring you. You know, like whenever you try to publish something on your social media and they say, fact checkers determine that this is false and blah, 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 blah. This goes against our community guidelines and all that. Well, that's what the Germans were doing back then. So he was actually, they decided, okay, so everything else we've done to you wasn't good enough. So now we're not going to allow you to publish anything whatsoever. In fact, we're not going to allow you to print anything. So, and as a pastor, you can imagine this is really kind of like a death blow to what he did for a living. Due to his uh, confessions, it is widely assumed that he knew about numerous plots against Hitler's life back in 1943, more than just the famous bombing that everybody talks about. Everybody talks about Blockery and the bombing and all that. And yeah, he was involved in that, but there was numerous different plots against him at the same time. So, SS Judge Otto Thorbeck at a Drumhand court, court Martial actually withheld witnesses from any evidence against him whatsoever. So there was no record, there was no proceedings, there was no defense for uh, Bonhiever in Fosburn concentration camp. They basically found him guilty of everything. So Himmler wrote up his report, or his SS squad wrote up his report, right? They held his trial at the concentration camp. So he was found, he was court-martialed, and they were, did this without any witnesses, without any evidence against him. There was no records of him doing anything wrong whatsoever. And in fact, there was not even official court proceedings. But he was still found guilty because that's what the German Nazis did. And he was hung at dawn in April 9th of 1945. So another side note um, that you should know is um, a doctor once stated, Pastor Bonhiever um, was kneeling on the floor and praying fervently to his God, passionately, just crying in tears. And it was, he basically said he was deeply moved by the way that this man loved and prayed so devoutly and so contently in his beliefs to his God with his prayers, especially at the place, at the place of execution. He again stated a short prayer. And then as he, the, the doctor was saying, as he was climbing the steps to the gallow, bravely and composed, he was still stating a prayer underneath his lips as he was going to the steps. Now his death ensued after only a few seconds. In almost 50 years, he said that I worked as a doctor. I have hardly ever seen a man die so entirely submissive to the will of his God. And I think that that's something that you should not just, that's something that you should remember. Sorry about the noise. I got dogs running around. So the account of his death um, has actually been debated. Okay, naturally. I actually added this in the other day when I was doing my research, I said, I should probably include this. The, the actual account that we're hearing about of his death has been debated. One expert said that it actually took six hours plus departures from the camp procedures that may not have been allowed um, to prisoners. So late in the war and jarring uh, numerous different inconsistencies with his report. Now his execution was actually ordered by the highest level of the Nazis by individuals within a pattern of torturing prisoners, okay? Who actually, anybody who dared challenge a Nazi party was really tortured to death by the same people at this particular camp that he was at. It was a whole camp of uh, employees that were basically the best of the best at torturing and getting information. So people said that his stay was most likely much worse than people actually stated. That the doctor 
was given the job of reviving the political prisoners, this particular doctor, after they had been hanged in order to prolong their deaths and to prolong their agony in the dying of their death. No one actually knows if he was actually cremated or buried in mass graves. So there is no body, but a plaque actually where he died. And then I want to go back here real quick. So I think ultimately when we look at Pastor um, Bonhiever, you know, his life story is a testament to what he believed. To be a martyr for your God. To live up to what Jesus said, even at your own great cost to your life. Whether it be your finances, your life, your family, your reputation, no matter what it is. Your life should be a reflection of your, of your belief in Christ. Even at your own cost. And I think his testament was literally... Literally, he lived up to that. His life story is a testament to that. He truly lived out his faith with an amazing courage, knowing all the risk involved. I mean, his story means to live out our own personal beliefs in the face of adversary. Um, he is one of those historic guys that basically reminds us that courage and conviction are essential components of a well-lived life. Uh, when I was thinking about World War II, and you know, like I said before at the start of this, I've done numerous different podcast episodes about World War II, and I mean a lot, and about a lot of different types of people. And as a Christian, I have been struggling with trying to get more Christian material for my podcast channel. And at the same time, I want to stay focused for my listeners that know me to do true crime, um, um, historic podcast episodes, and all of that. So I was thinking about if I'm going to do a history podcast episode, what person to do a good one on? And I decided on Bonhiever because he wasn't just a pastor. He was a resistance fighter. He died at 39 years old. That's younger than I am now. You know what I'm saying? Um, his family was very well off. Okay, so in the German culture, that means that uh, the Nazis, the high level Nazis were, they knew who his family was. They probably went to his house. Like, and at the same time all this was going on, he was actually secretly a resistance fighter. Listening to what they were saying, and then he was reporting it back to the other people, the resistance network. So everything that he found out, he was reporting back to them. The reason why the SS squad, originally why Heimlich Himmler, Heimlich Himmler, sorry, um, made it illegal for him to print anything, uh, to enter Berlin, to basically even talk in the city of Berlin uh, was literally due to that. There was a lot of suspicion that he was involved in the resistance network. At one point, they allowed him to travel around the city of Berlin, but he wasn't allowed to enter the city of Berlin. He was allowed to talk. He was allowed to go to different churches around Germany and on outside of Berlin, um, but he was not allowed to go in. So he relied on the network of different um, resistance fighters, so to speak. And pass information back and forth. And that's basically kind of what he did. Now, his death, let's look at his death again. They say that it was debated. Um, you know, a lot of people that study World War II will tell you that when it came down to it, um, the Nazis and the Russians, uh, torturing, I don't even think is a strong enough word to really explain exactly how bad they were and how wicked they were at getting information. I mean, we think you know what torturing is and you'd think that you might know what prolonging agony is uh, physically and mentally and emotionally. You might think you do, but when you get into, uh, when you get into World War II and you start looking at the Germans and you start looking at the Soviets, you find out that these people, they got off on pain. They got off on torturing. They would laugh. They would snicker. They would make jokes. They basically loved it. Um, death to the Nazis was hand in hand with their movement. Um, Himmler himself was obsessed with the occult. He loved dark imagery and he loved blood he was he was a very wicked he was a very wicked person in actuality um 
<clears throat> I'm not going to go into him just yet. But anyways, let's keep this on focus. So that's the reason why his death was actually debated, because they said here he is at one of the most notorious concentration camps. This is the specialist, okay? This was not your regular concentration camp. Even Auschwitz couldn't hold a candle to this place. This is not your regular concentration camp. This was a intelligence concentration camp. This was the best of the best of the SS squad. When they wanted high level information, they got to torture somebody to get that information. And this is tough guys that wouldn't break at a regular concentration camp. They sent them to this place because these people were the best of the best at getting information out of people. I want you to remember something. That doctor said, they said the doctor was known when you they hung somebody, right? To watch him. And as soon as he was about to lights go off, to lift him out of the noose so that they could prolong the agony of the death. That's how much they liked torturing. And that is the reason why they said that more than likely his death account is not accurate. He was probably much way worse. He was probably beaten. He was probably bloody. He was probably starved. You know what I mean? He was probably tortured. Body parts might have even been missing. This is a high level target for the Germans. His family was wealthy. The aristocrats. He was highly educated. And he was one of the leaders of the original resistance network. For all you people that think you know about Antifa. He was like the godfather. One of the godfathers of them. Okay, who we just talked about, just so you know. Um, and he was also a pastor. And he led one of the um, basically information networks that went against the uh, German state. So that's why they sent him there. So do I think that the accounts on his death might be off? Maybe. I can't say for sure if he was tortured more than what they're claiming he actually was and I don't think any of us can I've watched every movie I can about this guy doing this research there wasn't a there's a lot more written information about him than there was actual like documentary style stuff sorry about the dogs again everybody um, bear with me 